in our waiting room. Um, we do that for security purposes and uh, we really appreciate everybody being here, um, taking the time out of your day to do a little bit of uh, learning about teaching in this new fun platform. So just a little bit about who we are and why we're doing this. Um, we all work at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and we do a lot of online teaching. Um, we don't typically have a lot of platforms for children, but we have all worked with children or have children um, in our other lives. So we do want to offer this opportunity for some tips and tricks on making the most of this new platform for teaching. Um, and I am Eva Hermanska. Uh, with me are Brian Coos and Teresa Summer. And I'm actually going to throw it over to Brian for our first activity. So welcome again. And uh, Brian. Well, actually, let's. Um... Um, we've got about half the people that said they were going to be here, so let's give them uh, just a few more moments. And we were curious, uh, even though you indicated this on your pre-registration, um, but we wanted to get a, a kind of a quick snapshot of who you are. And so if you could really quickly, uh, you know, we'll leave this up for about a minute or so, uh, indicate what grade level you teach at. We would appreciate that. All right, I think we got everyone. All right. So there we have, uh, you know, kind of a mixture of uh, people from a lot of different uh, educational backgrounds here. And so it's good to see all of you here. Now, one of the things that, that uh, we're doing is uh, today we're talking about stars and patterns in the sky and some constellations. And so let's get a, a quick sense of what your skies are like. And I need to figure out where this is hiding. And so one of the really cool things that uh, Zoom can do, are we seeing the uh, main screen or are you seeing the presenter tools? What, what is it that you're, we're seeing? Okay, we're good. So one of the really cool things that, uh, that we can do actually in, um, in Zoom is you have a chance to kind of annotate some things. And this is something where you can interact, uh, have your audience interact with an image or interact with something else. And so here we've got a diagram. You can, we, we're thinking about which skies are yours. And so while we're kind of waiting, think about what the skies are like at your home. On your Zoom bar up at the, probably is up at the top, you should find a green view options button. If you click on that and then find the annotate button and in the little drop down menu um, when you click on view options. So select annotate. And then find the stamp tool. And with the stamp tool, choose a shape and then pick the image that most closely resembles the skies at your home.
So it looks like we've got uh, some people that are in some pretty urban skies and some people that, uh, uh, a few people that are very fortunate to have some very nice uh, dark skies. We've got one person with, uh, that kind of put a question mark up there, they're not sure. So Sorry, this no, actually was, was an image mark. that was, was on uh, the astronomy picture of the day just uh, a week or so ago. And so, yeah, let's see. And there's actually astronomers rate the night skies. And so there's a scale called the Bortle Skype scale. And so this kind of is a measure of sky darkness. And so if you're in a scale two, you have a really nice dark sky. If you're living in the city, like uh, uh, where I am in many places, it's uh, a scale seven. And I'm probably somewhere between a six or a seven where I am here in San Francisco because I can see a number of stars. Um, some of the brighter stars anyway. So what we want to do is we want to think a little bit about, and so let's go ahead and clear all of your annotations. How do we clear the annotations? Oh, we, it's a, we have to do it on our own. We click clear. Okay, I thank guess. you. That's what I thought. I was trying to find the button to do. This is something that's new for us. Zoom is adding some things, even though there's been an annotation up. Um, and so we're still learning how to work this. And I was thinking that maybe I had a button to clear everything at once. You so do I'm have a button to clear everything at once, Brian. I if do. you um, go to the trash can that says clear, you can highlight it ah. and then do clear all drawings or clear my drawings. Okay. That might be something that, uh, that you have as host. I'm just a co-host here, so. I believe so I'm a co-host If also, we look so. up at the sky and, huh? I, so, so if we look at the at a night sky, and so here's a night picture of uh, the night sky, and so this might be a fairly typical thing that we look up and we might see at night. And so, what I want you to do is, with your annotation, I want you to see if you can find the brightest star on here. Where's the brightest star? There's a galaxy in there, and so don't choose the galaxy. Okay, so there we've got a star, and so um, if everyone agrees with that, uh, you know, there we've got some other ones, and so so we've got some brighter stars that are there on there. So. There's also some dimmer stars that are on there. And so what do we know about, you know, where, where are some of the dimmer stars on here that maybe we wouldn't be able to see? Okay, so there's a question mark. There's John it was down there in the trees, it looked like. So Ava's down in the trees. So I guess there's gaps in the trees. So there's some bright stars and there are some darks, or there's some brighter stars and there are some not so bright stars. So if we if we zoom in on another one, so let's go ahead and clear that. And if you could help out doing that, uh, Teresa, that would be wonderful. And so if we if we zoomed in on a group of stars, let's call it the jewel box cluster. And this is actually a, a cluster of stars. You can see if you're in a, in the southern hemisphere, you cannot see it from the northern hemisphere. But this would be something where you might want to engage your students in thinking about, and you could do this on, online, and you could have them use the annotation button to indicate some of the differences that they're seeing in the stars. One of the things that they can also do as part of the annotation is they can add text. And so if you wanted to have people say add text, you might put here and you say, here's a red star, well, what else do you notice about the red star? The red stars tend to be dimmer than the other stars. And so there's some things that you could use to do this with your students remotely. This might be the sort of thing that you would be able to do fairly easily in the classroom by giving them an image and they could annotate the image on their own desk. But in this case, you know, how do you do this remotely? and virtually through Zoom. And so here's a tool that we potentially could use to be able to do that. Well, one of the things that we want to you know, think about is 
we want the students to maybe think about what it is that they are, you know, how are they thinking about these different stars? What are some ideas that they might have? And so this might be where, and we're going to kind of do this, I'm going to pull up the whiteboard. And so let me get rid of our scribble from earlier. And so what I'd like everyone to do is kind of just select the text and maybe put in some ideas that you have about why you think that some stars are appear brighter than others. So what are some ideas that you have? So this would be something that you could do also do in the chat, but I think that this would be nice because we can see a, a, a visual, see everything all at the same time. Okay, the size of the star closer to us. Okay, any others distance? If anybody's having a hard time with finding the text box, just raise your hand or yeah. unmute and I can help you out. And if you agree with some of these and somebody's already said something, you can take the stamp tool and you could put a check mark next to it, you could put a star next to it, you could put a heart next to it if you agree with any of these these things that are being suggested. And so here's a way that you can actually be interactive, have a little bit more interactive discussion, rather than feeling like you're just talking to, hopefully not to yourself. So we, we're getting some ideas. And so then what we want to do is we want to think about how could we test some of these things. If you're in a classroom setting, maybe you would uh, get some materials out. But let's go ahead and share some ideas about how you think we might test some of these ideas. And so go ahead and uh, feel free to unmute yourself and share some of the ways that you think um, that we could test some of these ideas about distance, um, about the different kinds of stars, the different uh, brightness, inherent brightness that stars have. So what are some things that we could do to test that in a classroom setting or in a home setting where you don't have access to all your materials at home? Um, we could look at the thought that comes to my mind is looking at data tables and seeing is there, because I'm sure data has been taken on which stars, you know, have the brightest, you know, appearance like measured and then see is there a correlation with distance? Is there a correlation with size of those stars? And, you know, plot it, graph it with the students. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. For, what are some uh, other investigations? And I think we're, we're kind of focusing in on, this is a fifth grade standard having to do with uh, the idea of why different stars appear differently in the sky. If for, somebody started to say something, Michael. Uh, yeah, I started to say for uh, brightness versus distance, uh, you could use a grease spot for to a photometer uh, and do with distance between different light bulbs or a light bulb in the sun. Um, and that, like all kids would have at home, they'd have paper and oil and at least one light bulb. Mm. Okay. Um, another thought that's more, well, I, I suppose, yeah, they could, they could still do it at home. Um, if they could have access to, you know, a flashlight or two flashlights or, you know, the phone light. Um, this was, this was kind of an activity that the, I'm in Utah and that the, the planetarium kind of showed uh, some of us teachers just the you know the light that's closer to you is going to look brighter than the one that's far away even if it's the same wattage even if it's the same brightness closer will look brighter okay well well i'm going to throw really a little monkey wrench in i'm sorry what what about if the other source isn't the same brightness what if it's brighter than the close one mm -hmm. Right. If some, um, the problem astronomers have had for decades is if a star is, we don't know if a star is close by and dim or far away, but very bright. And so we've, we've had to come up with all kinds of ways to detect that. So I'm not, I'm not expecting you to, to jump on board, Isaac. I just was uh, wanting to share that idea and, and get your wheels turning. Um, yeah. 
I mean, and that could that could raise some good questions about it does. You know, for the kids, like it's I guess show that it's not just distance either, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that I'll probably touch on a little bit later on in our presentation, but I was thinking possibly if you're doing some journaling and you look at the same star uh, and look at it on a night that has a new moon and then watch as the moon gets full, how that affects the brightness of that particular star. Okay, so let's do something here before I go to that. What I wanna do is let's clear this. Here, I'll draw this. And so what I'd like you to do is to, uh, we had considered breaking this up into some breakup group groups, but let's go ahead and just keep us all together here. And let's start putting some things down and trying doing some drawings maybe about what our model is about what could influence how bright something looks, how bright a star looks. And so let me see if I can, let me put an X for us. And so if we're here where the X is, let's imagine that. And so go ahead and um, use the annotation bar and use some of these things and see if you can come up with some models or some ideas having to do with these suggestions that you had previously about what influences how bright a star is. And so we had some good ideas here that some stars are more distant but are brighter and so they look brighter. Some stars are closer but they're not as bright and yet they look brighter. And so go ahead and see if you can play around with this a little bit before I show you the next thing. You might need to use some words to go along with this too, so. So how many of you use whiteboards in your in your classrooms? If any of you use whiteboards and um, in your classroom, feel free to weigh in about how you use those and how you see this as being similar or some of the challenges that you would see with doing this virtually. I think there's a lot of challenges of trying to do this virtually, but uh, if you're uh -huh. with doing this in your classroom uh, physically, um, you know, what are, what are some, you know, added challenges with this? Yeah, well, I know, I know like in my classroom, I've had whiteboard and uh, smart board to be able to do this. And I just know one challenge is it's a lot harder to um, show what I want using a mouse than it is just to use a pen or a marker, you know, it's a lot harder to control what's coming out with a mouse. Yes. And that certainly is something that, uh, you know, that, you know, can get in the way. So we've got some really good ideas here. We got an idea that the clouds might get in the way that would impede some of the light that would dim the stars. Um, if it's the same size star, uh, the closer one, uh, if two stars are the same size, same brightness, the closer one will appear brighter. Um, two sources of different brightness um, that, you know, how could you have two stars that look the same brightness, um, that are not the same brightness, but look the same brightness? How would a dimmer star be look the same as a really super bright star? What would you do to make it so that the dim star and the bright star look the same? What would they do? And, and that idea kind of came from thinking like an uh, Ames room, um, like whereby judging having two different distances, you could have 
a person appear much bigger than the other, but with light sources and the brightness, like a, a miniature version of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking that kind of, uh, my wife and I have watched some brain games on Disney Plus and talk about I can use perspective to, to trick you on thinking things are closer or further, right? Or the size, just by the frame of reference. It could look the same size as something else, but it's actually a lot bigger and further away. So I put some thought into this, and it's a challenge trying to do some hands-on activities sometimes um, doing this, because you always want your students to not just have the experience of having, you know, thinking this through together as a group or even individually. Uh, we could have broken it up into small groups and, and did it that way. Um, but how do you get your students to go and test this? And so I was thinking about that. And in some ways, I have the luxury of having multiples of these things. But let me kind of show you what I came up with. And so here I've got kind of a setup where, and I need to see what my own looks like. So I think that I've got this. Let me move this up just a little bit. So now I've got three flashlights that I set up. And so what could we say about the brightness of these three flashlights? And, and this is a fairly, you know, it's not a really well lit um, room, but the hallway going down there at least is, uh, is a little bit dark. And so what could we say about these three flashlights? Any comments about these three lights? Which one looks brighter? The one closest to the your laptop looks. Yeah, the the far left one looks brightest. Okay, and which one looks dimmest? The reddish one. Okay, the reddish one. So this is kind of an interesting thing. And so, what would you? What sort of a conclusion might you make about, say, the reddish one, and then the further further one away that looks to be kind of intermediate brightness? What would you say about those two? Um, well, you know, uh, it helps to have our three-dimensional frame of reference of your mm -hmm. building. Yeah, if we didn't, cool. if we didn't have that, we just had blackness. It'd be easy to think that the the dim one is further away or it's smaller. One of those things is not as bright. Okay. So it turns out that how I set this up, and I know we've got a couple other things to do, and so we'll do fairly quickly. This light here is actually identical to the furthest one. They're identical flashlights with, uh, I think, eight LEDs in them. And so they're identical. And so if you know that they're identical, and there's ways of, you know, looking at stars to see whether or not they are the same star, whether or not they're putting out the same amount of light. So what would we say about this star that is significantly brighter than the most, you know, the other one that's out there. What would we say about that if we know that they're the same inherent brightness? Closer. It's closer. So what would we say about the other two? And so down, down here, we've got this redder one, and then we've got the other one there. What would you say about those two, you know, and, and granted, when you look out at the night sky, you don't have that distance, like, you know, that was a really good point, is that you don't have that distance reference. Here, you've kind of got a distance reference. You can tell that that one's much further away, but that one is much, that's much further away is far brighter than this redder one. And so what can we say about the star that is represented by this one compared to this one, even though it's significantly further away? What, what can we say about that? either that it's brighter or larger. Okay. So some of the reasons, for some reason or another, we could engage in discourse with this rather than just uh, you know, stopping, but uh, somehow or another that more distant star is inherently brighter than this closer, dimmer one. Now, a couple other things, I'm gonna turn this one off just because it's kind of overwhelming things. And so one of the other things that is possible is that some of you may have things like this. And so this particular one, actually, if you do it right, 
you can change the brightness settings on it. I have another one that also you do that, but rather than having definite increments, you can change it, change the amount of bright. And, and so it's kind of a, so it's possible that there are tools that students have or that you have to be able to alter the brightness of your stars so that you can model the difference between the inherent brightness of a star, the distance, and how that influences the appearance of brightness that we see when we look up at the night sky. And then we've got the added complication if we want to come back to thinking about, and I'm not sure if this is going to work because uh, I haven't done this one, but then the added one is, okay, so which stars are we going to be more likely to be able to see under urban skies? Are we going to be able to see the brighter stars or those dimmer stars that are either much further away or they're not as inherently bright? Which ones are we going to tend to see? What do you think? Brighter, I see the brighter. Uh, not only will we see the brighter stars, but we can also see the bluer stars uh, a little bit more easily. Like, especially if we use a color filter, but e even without one, with, with the naked eye, light pollution tends to be more of the, the sodium orange. And so bluer stars can be more visible in urban settings. Okay, and so there's another consideration. Not only are blue stars inherently brighter than red stars, um, but the light pollution might influence it too. So I haven't tried this one. And so um, I wanna make sure that we're spotlighted on me here. This is the first time I've done this. Um, I have a, let's see what happens to our ability to see these lights. What happened to the ability to see these lights when I turned on a 500 watt light bulb? What happened to the ability, did the, did the lights stand out as much or did they kind of apparently become dimmer? What happened? So, no light pollution, light pollution. They don't appear to be dimmer, but they seem to be less, um, less stand, they stand out less. Yeah, I mean, wash out with the background. Okay. It's an imperfect, uh, uh, you know, way of looking at it. Um, but I thought that it would uh, that it would be kind of a, a nice way to, to kind of you know, try to demonstrate that anyway. I wanted to just show one other quick thing and then I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa. And so the other way you can think about this that um, students have maybe a better idea is if you relate this to cars on a freeway. How do you know that that car is a long ways away? Well, the lights aren't as bright and cars, the closer they get, the brighter their lights tend to be. And these days, of course, with some of the halogen bulbs that they use, sometimes it's hard to know whether or not it's close or far. But certainly this is a traditionally kind of a way to think about the distance and the brightness of, uh, of these lights. You could also think about, and this is something that Teresa is gonna get into, here's a distant view of a city, you know, the sky looks uh, okay. You know, it's a little bit dark there. But then the closer we get into these lights, the more embedded we are into the lights, and the more we notice that, you know, we're not able to see as much of the nice dark sky as we once were able to. And so this is another way to kind of think about why it is that we can see some stars, even in light polluted skies and but we need to have the darkest of skies to see many many more stars and so with that i'm going to turn over to teresa 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I wanted to share some more thoughts about light pollution. So, um, and also about constellations and how we can find them and how your students can do actual scientific research. So I'm going to share my screen now and talk about globe at night. And if I can just hold on a second, wrong share. Ah. Third time's a charm. Great. Okay. So I'm going to talk about globe at night. And before I get started, I want to just see by like a show of hands or a digital reaction, uh, how many of you have heard about globe at night? Steve, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, Robin too. Okay. So just a few of you. And um, what Globe at Night is, it's a program that's been running about 15 years and it is, uh, it was just like one week a year, but now it's one week a month. And so they actually have different constellations that are um, shown during different seasons of the year. And so this is Orion, which is one of the two constellations that most people know of, right? Um, if you could see my arrow there, there's three stars that are all about the same brightness all in a row, equally spaced. And that's a good sign that you're looking at Orion. That's his belt. And below him, he has knees. And above him, he has shoulders. His head is not very bright. He's kind of dim. Um, so this is what you can see in um, a guy that's medium. In the city, you might only see four of these bright stars. Um, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky after the sun. And so um, the issue with globe at night is just that there has been light pollution for a long time, but there hasn't been any tracking of it. And so um, Here's sort of what's going on with light pollution over time. You can see this is in the late 50s when lights were mostly starting to go up in street lights. Then in the 70s, it got brighter. And in the 97, it went super bright. Um, and this paper was sort of extrapolating that to 2025, which we're very close to <laughs> as compared to 2001, right? Um, we're seeing that lights are really taking away a lot of the dark skies. Um, so there's different hooks that you can get for having your students be interested in light pollution. Um, some of them are really concerned about the baby turtles that can't make it to the ocean because the lights are confusing to them. Or uh, some of them might be really interested in space and care about not being able to see the stars or our safety or energy costs more. Those are more things that adults care about. But also um, human health is affected by uh, light pollution. And so when your um, students have trouble sleeping, it might be because there's some bright lights that are shining in their windows and keeping them up. Because it does affect your circadian rhythms, even if you have a screen on late at night. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of ways that you can either in your neighborhood or in your town make things better for people. So uh, if you look up, this is very similar to what we had when um, at the beginning of the talk when we had you pick which skies, which your skies looked at. And then down on the bottom are the lights that make that light pollution. Something you might not see right away, if you look at the worst example, there's actually a small figure there. Well, it's really hard to see them until you move along to a very focused light, focused downward. When our lights shine up into the sky where we don't need them instead of down on the ground where we do, it's also not good for people and seeing things and visibility, which is what we hope to use lights for. So 
Um, this is an app you can use, um, Globe at Night, where you can either do it on your phone, you can do it on the website, you can even do it with printing out the, um, the pages they have on the website. But it's really quick, where and when did you make your observations? Was it dark? Was it cloudy? Um, and then you send the data off to scientists. And then you can make a big um, impact on that. Um, these are the dates for 2020. You can see May 14th through 23rd is right around the corner. So um, I want to encourage you to check out Globe at Night or Dark Sky Association and see how you can get your students involved into doing scientific research through citizen science. Um, once they submit that, we'll have we have data now from 135 countries, I believe. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a really interesting project that they can help out with. And so I'm going to use this annotate feature now um, to show you some stars. If you look at this image here, can you see the Big Dipper? You can either Give me a sign on your digital reaction. Give me a thumbs up if you are able to find the Big Dipper. Ava and John are saying yes, mm -hmm. Robin saying yes. Great. Anyone else? Okay. So I am going to sort of highlight the area where it is. Okay. So there are four stars that make up the bowl of the dipper, and then there's three stars in the handle. If this was what you were looking at, then you're correct. And again, if you weren't correct, then that's okay too, because that's why we're here to learn. The great thing about the Big Dipper is that once you find where this is, you can find other stars. Now, this is called star hopping. It's how I learned the sky. It's a little different in a digital world, but you can still find a lot of ways to show people what's going on with the sky. And so a lot of times people will take these two stars at the end of the bowl and point them towards Polaris, which is up here. Yes, and if you follow the arc here, we can arc to Arcturus. Um, so let's, let's do that. Hold on. When I was, when I was pr presenting this earlier, it let me remove the controls. There. So now I, once I move those annotation controls, I can draw. So here's the Big Dipper. Really important constellation through much of history because um, we not only had this uh, slaves escape by using that to find north, we also had a lot of folks try to uh, use it for different um, constellations and timing things. You can still use it today as a clock in the sky. But again, if we follow this arc to the next bright star, we can arc to Arcturus, and that's the name of this star here. And the cool thing about, great. <laughs> so if you can go to that, that star, yes. And then this is, a, that's, not spica is farther down yes anyway Boetes is this constellation right up here it's supposed to be a hunter but to me it looks more like an ice cream cone and that's something your students can find and use to measure the darkness in their area to measure the um, for globe at night because that's the constellation for may the other thing you can use for globe at night is use these two pointer stars but don't go towards the north star go 
towards Leo the lion. You can land on the back of Leo. And so Leo is not, uh, to me, always looks like those lions they have at the library in New York. Uh, so you have like a backwards question mark here that marks the main and has a bright period. And then there's also a triangle here that represents the hindquarters of the lion. And so kind of that whole area together is the constellation. And so these are two um, constellations you can see in the sky right now. And it's a great way to get your kids out and looking at the sky. And so I really want to encourage you to go out and check out these constellations. It's okay to use the asterisms that they, the things that they look like rather than what their constellation name is. Does anybody have any questions about that? That's good. Cool. So a lot of times when people look up at the sky and see a bunch of stars, it, it's hard to find your way. So um, it looks like just a bunch of dots. And so that way, if you find the Big Dipper in the summertime or in the springtime in this case, or if you can find Orion in the wintertime, or there's a, it'll help you find your way around the sky. Oh, there's a whole lot of um, a whole lot of comments in the chat that I didn't see. So yeah, the name of the constellation well, first was the Big Dipper, which is Ursa Major, actually the Big Bear, and then Boötes, the herdsman, is kind of uh, looks like an ice cream cone to me, and also we saw Leo. So with that kind of wrapped up, finding patterns in the sky, you know, it's in a lot of next generation science standards. So um, whether it's um, tracking changes over time in the third grade or whether it's um, practicing uh, patterns in the sky for the fifth. And Brian, there's one in the fourth that's about journaling, I think, yes? Um, I'm not as familiar with the fourth grade one. I know I'm more familiar with the space science ones in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because the astronomy, there's not an astronomy one that is directly in the fourth grade, but there is um, a lot of science practices that you can use astronomy to illustrate. And so and, what I was going to talk about was... That was um, my segue to you. <laughs> and, and actually, uh, let me, uh, you know, Isaac has an interesting point here. Utah's weird took the framework, made its own because of it. A lot of states did that. And uh, Utah in particular, because Brett Molding um, is, was one of the primary writers and people that have advocated for the next generation science standards. And uh, he's been uh, kind of a, a, an, an evangelist and he's a wonderful person. He's, he's fantastic. And, um, and so it's no surprise that the Utah standards bear an uncanny resemblance to the NGSS. So um, one of the things when we were discussing what we would talk about, especially with regards to this particular uh, segment of third to fifth graders, um, and I know a lot of you um, are high school or a little bit older than this age range, but I do think it's true for all of us, even us way older than third to fifth grade, um, is that right now things are kind of up in a, in, in a very chaotic upheaval mode for many of your students. And so creating and doing activities that highlight that there are constants um, it, it kind of is reassuring. It's kind of nice if you're doing a journaling activity, um, which doesn't just have to be constellations. I think that's a really beautiful one and a really great one if you do have access to night skies or if your parents let you out once you can see them. Uh, but this can be applied to maybe you have a tree out your window and uh, you are journaling about whether it has 
10 buds on Monday, 11 on Tuesday, how many leaves opened from day to day. And it recenters and refocuses the idea that even when there's a lot of things that are unpredictable um, and a little scary, there are things that are going to keep kind of going and there's patterns and it's kind of a, um, I would say an emotional and a morale boost for a lot of students if they make predictions in their journals and those predictions come true. Um, so that might be something you kind of think about when you're planning your lessons is you can build that in. I know teachers are a huge source of comfort. Um, you guys are a rock for your students. Not all of them have perfect home lives. Maybe they're stuck with people who aren't always nice to them. I mean, there's a lot of different things that are happening right now that um, you have lost the ability to um, give in a classroom. And just remember, you're still able to do that from these new ways of, of being there for them. So creating activities that um, they find rewarding um, via pattern finding, via journaling, and then also um, coming together as groups and discussing. And um, I'm not sure how many of you uh, watched our first and second installments of this series. Probably, I know definitely some of you were in the first one because um, I recognize you. <laughs> but um, I will have Teresa post in the chat links to the recordings of those first two because we go into a lot more of those technical, here's how you use this feature of Zoom or here's how you, you know, talk about this sort of situation. So those are gonna uh, get posted in the chat but I also wanted to try a breakout room um, scenario with you guys. So you see the difference between this large group environment where there's a primary speaker, maybe screen sharing, showing some demos, doing some activities versus getting your, your classroom broken up and doing small group discussions like they would in your classroom. So I'm just going to do a random breakout room and we will, the cards will fall where they may and we will, um, what did we decide we were gonna be discussing in the breakout room, Brian? I'm not sure that we decided. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about um, the things that you see in the night sky um, and everyone can interpret that prompt in whatever way you want as a group once we're in there. And then we will come back and we will report back. So I'm just going to put us into these breakout rooms. Um, uh, let me see. Move all participants into breakout rooms automatically. <laughs> and then I will close the breakout room after, let's do five minutes. So I'm just saying this because I can't screen share and do it at the same time. But uh, there will be a link on how to do this with the, it's in the other video. So. Um, Yes, and the two videos are now in the chat. Uh, the first one is the general one that we did for uh, teachers of all grades. And then the second one is the pre-K through second. Okay, let's see. And for the people that are in the breakout room that I'm in, I'm going to do something. And then when we get back together, I'm going to show you what I did. And it's another way to um, generate more discourse that comes back to the group from the small groups. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this now. You'll all get an invitation to a room. So just accept the invitation once you've received it. <laughs>
I think, <laughs> thank you, we have people popping back in from the breakout rooms, um, just checking around to make sure. I know sometimes it, it staggers. Some people, it takes them a little bit longer to, to pop back in. Um, my daughter is in first grade and it's like an hour scheduled Zoom call that's like still probably about 20 minutes of content and 40 minutes of technical difficulties. So we're always trying to be patient with that. Um, just making sure all our participants are still here and popping back in. Great. Okay. Um, I also noticed um, as the host of this meeting that there was one person and I could not find them who was unassigned. So if that was you, I apologize. I don't know how that happened. And perhaps it was just me and that I was unassigned because I was, I was a floater. Um, but I think um, I'll have Brian from your breakout room. Um, yeah, let me, let me just share this real quickly. And I know that Ava had something else that she wanted to mention. One of the things that I showed people was that we shared and we had a couple of people do this. And this is a really great thing to be able to do to, if you want your students working in small groups but then being able to share their ideas with the whole group. And so we shared the whiteboard, we made some annotations, and so then you can save it. And so I'm going to bring that up if I could find it. And so here I've got this one window. And so in here, I've got a number of different uh, whiteboards that were saved. And so let me see if I can figure out which one it was that we last did. And so I brought this up and this is the sorts of things that we jotted on our whiteboard during our breakout session. And so then hopefully your students have something meaningful that they can share with the rest of the group to um, add to the discussion. You could have some sort of a little um, symposium if you wanted, but certainly the opportunity to do some sharing out from small group work. And so this is uh, yet another tool to make this platform a little bit more engaging for the students and to get them to uh, kind of force them to have a voice within for their own learning rather than just uh, it being one way. Hey, Brian, can each yes, sir. breakout room do a whiteboard and bring back and share their whiteboard? Yeah, that's what we just did. Oh, really? Cool. That's what we just yeah, what Brian just showed was what they were working on in their breakout room. Yeah. Okay. So it would be a matter of, I guess, training your kids to know how to do that, right? So kind of establishing the, the procedure. Right. right. And we talked about that in our group a little bit, which was just that you can go as the host to the different breakout rooms. And if you save their uh, whiteboard while you're in there, Mm -hmm. You can save it for each room, but it, it is challenging to to do that, especially. That's, that's really cool, though. Yeah, yeah. Just make sure they hit save before they go back to the main room. So. Right. And hopefully they're doing that instead of like drawing pictures. Yeah. Uh, uh, drawing another, pictures is good, too. Uh, another cool strategy uh, that you could sometimes use for multiple breakout rooms, um, but it like it wouldn't work all the time. I've got a couple of older students who have volunteered to join me for a younger class. And we're going to be doing an activity where each of the older students is managing a breakout room with like six or seven younger students. That's great. Um, so if, like if you teach multiple levels, that's a cool strategy to bring in. Or if you're stuck, well, not stuck, but if you just have one level, you could get one or two of your more eager students to be in charge of like specific tasks you've agreed on ahead of time where they can help sub manage breakout rooms if you can't be everywhere at once. Maybe parents too, I, I, I don't, it depends on like your, your specific case. And the one thing we didn't do, although Ava could have, since she's the one who set up the breakout rooms and is the host, she could have floated from room to room and checked on what everyone was doing. I meant so, to, but I got so yeah. <laughs> engrossed in talking and listening. <laughs> so I, I know that, uh, you know, you're used to when students work in small groups, you circulate around the classroom. And so, yes, you can do that when they're working in small groups with the breakout. If you're the one that, that did the breaking out and did the formative groups, you can do 
to do that. I, and one I, other thing that I wanted to just really quickly touch on is um, a lot of times you can assign things and have the students screen share their work. So if you're going to be meeting, you know, maybe once a week or from one day to the next, and they've got their journaling that they've done, they don't have to do it on the whiteboard. If it's too cumbersome to try to draw things like constellations or, you know, have them just uh, draw it and take a picture, do a screen grab, and then share it, um, say, okay, now Bob do the screen share. So um, yeah, there's a lot of workarounds with that kind of stuff too. Did you want to say something, Michael? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to the idea of the host can go to different breakout rooms, but also the host can assign anyone else, including a co-host, to move from one breakout room to another. Right. So like something I tried last week, which it, it gets really confusing as well, but I had a co-host who was a grade 11 student, and I was moving her to different breakout rooms when she'd send me a message to say, okay, I'm ready to switch breakout room. Meanwhile, I was switching to breakout rooms. So we had like two people circulating around breakout rooms. But one of the problems with that is the chat function in Zoom, you can only chat within your breakout room. So we were actually conversing on WhatsApp uh, while doing the Zoom meeting. So she'd be telling me when she was ready to switch to uh, different breakout rooms. Uh, the the co-host can't move people, only the co-host can. So it, like it gets confusing, but it, it's something you can have fun trying out too. Yeah. But well, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. It is four o'clock. Um, so I am going to throw it over to Teresa to wrap it up for everybody. And uh, this will be recorded um, and posted. So hopefully I will get those links out to everyone. And um, you know, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. And I've had a lot of fun with you guys this, this webinar. I, I just want to say again, thank you for coming. And if you would like, we can stay on for a little bit. I am going to stop the recording though, so that if people have particular things they want to share that we can do that. But I want to say thank you and respect your time so that you can head out if you need to.